Coming up on this Wednesday edition of Newsline at noon, the defense chiefs of South Korea and the U.S. sign a deal to counter threats posed by North Korea's weapons of mass destruction. The two sides have yet to decide on Seoul's request to delay the transfer of Washington's wartime operational control to Seoul. Despite record-breaking runs by Korea's global brands like Samsung and Hyundai, the prolonged economic slowdown has pushed many of the nation's conglomerates into financial difficulties. Plus, U.S. President Barack Obama calls on the Republicans to approve his health care reforms and end the partial government shutdown. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. The best place for beef and bop. Les Jeux Olympiques d'hiver se dérouleront-ils à Pyeongchang? Korea is attracting interest from around the world. The more you know, the more you want to know. Dynamic Korea. Thanks for joining us. You're watching Newsline at noon. I'm Chi Yuzan in Seoul. Fantastic to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. We begin at the Defense Ministry in Seoul, where the South Korea U.S. Security Consultative Meeting has just ended. During the annual Defense Dialogue, South Korean Defense Minister Kim Guan Jin and U.S. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel endorsed a tailored deterrence strategy against North Korean nuclear and missile threats that calls for a tighter alliance framework. Through the strategy, the two sides will strengthen the integration of alliance capabilities to maximize deterrence effects. The two defense chiefs were unable, however, to reach a clear-cut conclusion on the pending issues of the transfer of wartime operational control from Washington to Seoul, originally slated for 2015. They agreed to continue discussing the matter, paying particular attention to the security situation on the Korean Peninsula. On the last day of the UN General Assembly in New York, a North Korean representative has accused Washington of stoking tensions on the Korean Peninsula. The official said the only way to defuse tensions is for the U.S. to end its hostile policy towards North Korea. And Hwang Sung-hee has the details. North Korea says the United States is at fault for decades of tensions on the Korean Peninsula. In a speech at the UN General Assembly on Tuesday, North Korean Vice Foreign Minister Park Gideon said that Washington, with its hostile policy, has set North Korea as its target number one. Because North Korea holds a different ideology and system from itself, the United States designated our country as its enemy from day one, refusing to recognize our sovereignty and imposing all sorts of sanctions, pressures and military threats for more than half a century. The North Korean official accused Washington of manipulating the United Nations Security Council, saying the U.S. forced through U.N. sanctions over its peaceful rocket launch. The Security Council slapped additional sanctions on the North in January for launching a rocket considered equivalent to a long-range missile and after its third nuclear test in February. It represents a typical example of how and for what purpose the power of the U.N. Security Council is being abused. Park's speech comes amid fresh tensions on the Korean Peninsula after weeks of seemingly amicable inter-Korean relations. In response to recent signs that North Korea may be expanding its nuclear program, South Korea unveiled its new missile capable of pinpoint strikes across the border. The parade was attended by U.S. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel, once again reaffirming Seoul and Washington's strong alliance. The North Korean official said that the only way to secure peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula is for Washington to step away. Hwang Sung-hee, Arirang News. Korea's leading conglomerates have dominated the domestic economy for decades now, but in recent years, many of them have been struggling under the weight of increased debt and sluggish earnings. 
And with the economic outlook at home and abroad remaining very bleak, it doesn't look like it will be easy for the companies to reduce their debt burdens anytime soon. Uh, Huang Jie has the details. New fears of a wave of corporate bankruptcies were spurred when Dongyang Group, one of Korea's biggest conglomerates, filed for court receivership to avert bankruptcy early this week. Leading up to the filing, the group's debt ratio had increased more than eightfold to 1,231 percent last year from five years ago, a prime indicator of its declining financial health. The story is similar for other local conglomerates like Hanjin and Hyundai Group, both of which have debt ratios of over 400 percent. It's no surprise then that the total amount of debt held by the nation's top 30 conglomerates nearly doubled to about 600 trillion won, or roughly 550 billion U.S. dollars, in just five years. It's easy to think that Korean conglomerates are doing well as the earnings of some major companies like Samsung Electronics and Hyundai Motor are high. But with the exception of those two, the earnings of many of the rest of the conglomerates are slowing down. While slumping domestic and global economic conditions are adding to the conglomerate's woes, it seems inevitable the companies will have to take some innovative steps to maintain their financial health. In these kinds of circumstances, it's hard to expect an economic recovery. The company should seek to change their organization to overcome the difficulties. With so many conglomerates facing mounting debt, experts now warn about the problems it could cause for the economy as a whole. Huang Jie, Arirang News. China's week-long National Day holiday has begun and a record number of Chinese tourists are expected to visit Korea during this time. The nation's major shopping districts, duty-free shops and tourist attractions are already bustling with Chinese visitors. The Korea Tourism Organization predicts that around 150,000 Chinese visitors will travel to Korea from October 1st to the 7th and that is up 50 percent from last year. To welcome the Chinese visitors, the KTO will hold various events during the week, such as a special greeting ceremony for tourists arriving at Incheon International Airport and shopping promotions in major shopping districts like Myeongdong. For your fill of Korean and international news. Join Che Yu Sun and Mark Broom every weekday at lunchtime. Newsline at noon. Plenary session this Wednesday and vote on the government restructuring bills. And to the latest on the first U.S. government shutdown in nearly 20 years, President Barack Obama has accused his Republican opponents of holding the entire U.S. economy hostage in the row over his health care reforms. With Congress still in deadlock, core parts of Obamacare took effect on Tuesday. A UDN has the latest. The first partial government shutdown in 17 years forced hundreds of thousands of federal workers to go home Tuesday, out of work and out of luck. You really want to know what I think of Congress right now? Honestly, I think they need to get their act together, stop acting like children and pass the budget. The stalemate in Congress failed to stop the closure of federal agencies and government services across the country on Tuesday. The Democrat-led Senate had, for the fourth time, thrown out a spending plan by the Republican-led House of Representatives that aims to undermine President Obama's health care plan. Republicans in the House of Representatives refused to fund the government unless we defunded or dismantled the Affordable Care Act. They've shut down the government over an ideological crusade to deny affordable health insurance to millions of Americans. He also urged the Republicans to raise the $16.7 trillion debt ceiling that the government expects to hit on October 17th, saying a failure to do so would be devastating to the U.S. economy. A week-long government shutdown for now could cut the country's economic growth by a third of a percentage point, according to Goldman Sachs. While Republicans and Democrats remain at loggerheads over the budget bill, core parts of Obamacare went into effect Tuesday. The online health insurance marketplaces met with higher-than-expected demand on their first day live. 
Around 3 million people have visited the federal website since midnight, according to the Department of Health and Human Services. The Obama administration hopes to have 7 million people signed up during the first year. And eventually, at least half of the nearly 50 million, or 15 percent of Americans, who don't have health insurance. The health care plans are slated to begin next year. Yunian, Arirang News. On Wall Street, U.S. stocks kicked off with gains on Tuesday as investors remain confident the partial government shutdown will be short-lived. The Dow Jones Industrial Average climbed 62 points, or 0.4 percent, and the S&P 500 rose by over 13 points, or 0.8 percent. Market watchers say that once the government starts running again, the market will move higher, backed by a positive outlook for the global economy. Latest round of upbeat economic data showed U.S. manufacturing expanded at the fastest pace since April of 2011 in September on stronger production and hiring. The mission to dismantle Syria's stockpile of chemical weapons has begun with the arrival of international disarmament experts in Damascus. Their first priority will be to figure out how to destroy the equipment and facilities that allowed Syria to produce the weapons in the first place. Kim Minji reports. A team of international inspectors arrived in the Syrian capital Tuesday to start work on verifying and eliminating the country's stockpile of chemical weapons. The group of 20 from the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons will first meet with Syrian officials and then they'll start the process of figuring out how to reach the weapons and carry out their mission. The Syrian government says it has offered to cooperate with the team. The government has been very cooperative. It is the party that volunteered joining the, the uh, uh, Organization for Non-Proliferation of Chemical, of chemical Weapons. The international community estimates that Syria has about 1,000 tons of chemical weapons in its arsenal. The initial group of inspectors who are working under a UN Security Council resolution will have until the middle of next year to clear away Syria's chemical weapons stockpile. A second group of inspectors is expected to arrive in Syria in the coming weeks to aid the mission. But their first task is to destroy the equipment and facilities used to produce chemical weapons, and they've set a deadline of November 1st. It's a task that could prove extremely difficult, as almost half of the sites declared by the government are in combat areas. The operation comes after a deadly chemical attack on the outskirts of Damascus on August 21st that killed hundreds of people. The U.S. and the other nations hold the Syrian government responsible. But Damascus blames the rebels, and Syria's foreign minister claimed on Monday that a number of regional and well-known Western countries are supplying the rebels with chemical weapons. Kim Minji, Arirang News. World Bank President Jim Yong Kim has vowed to increase funding for fragile and conflict-affected countries by 50 percent over the next three years. Speaking at George Washington University on Tuesday, Kim said the plan is in line with the bank's goal of ending poverty and boosting shared prosperity. He said the World Bank will prioritize countries emerging from or affected by conflict, saying conflict often erupts in countries that remain in a persistent state of fragility. He added the bank will need to be bolder and invest more resources to increase its commitment to these troubled states, even if that means taking more risks. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has warned the West against working with the Iranian government, saying President Hassan Rouhani is nothing more than a, quote, wolf in sheep's clothing. Addressing the UN General Assembly Tuesday, Netanyahu said Israel would not allow Iran to develop nuclear weapons, even if it had to stand alone on the issue. Tehran says its nuclear program is for peaceful purposes only and called Netanyahu's remarks extremely inflammatory. Netanyahu also said that a nuclear-armed Iran would be as dangerous as 50 North Koreas. Relations between Iran and the U.S. have thawed since Rouhani came to power with the Iranian leader, recently speaking to President Obama on the phone, the first time the leaders of the two countries have spoken for more than 30 years. 
Turning now to the latest on the political crisis engulfing Italy. Italians are bracing themselves for the result of a confidence vote on Wednesday, the outcome of which could determine if Prime Minister Enrico Letta can stay in power. In order to continue in government, Letta needs to secure a majority in the Senate or win the votes of senators from Silvia Berlusconi's People of Freedom Party. A win seems more likely as Berlusconi's party may break, may break apart as his former allies turn against him. This comes after the billionaire former prime minister withdrew his ministers from the coalition and called for new elections following his conviction for tax fraud. The Tokyo National Museum has on display a helmet and armor that are almost certainly used, were almost certainly used, by Korea's Emperor Gojong during the Joseon era. Korean historians believe they are all stolen items, but Japan claims to have got them through a legal procedure. Our Son Jung-in has this story. The Asian Gallery at Tokyo National Museum is currently holding a special exhibition titled Art of the Joseon Dynasty. The gallery, which displays historical works and relics from all across Asia, is featuring costumes, furnishings and accessories from Korea's Joseon dynasty, which ran from 1392 to 1910. In particular, you can spot a helmet and armor adorned with a dragon phoenix pattern. The helmet with a white jade ornament on top represents the symbol of the highest ranking, while the armor with the embroidery of a five-claw dragon and wings on each shoulder unmistakably proves it belonged to a king. Korean experts say it must have belonged to Emperor Gojong, who ruled Korea between 1863 and 1907. The Japanese museum, however, does not state that the artifacts are royal family remains. It only mentions that the items were donated in the 19th century by the Okura family. Takinosuke Okura, a Japanese businessman, is known to have collected more than 1,000 artifacts during the Japanese colonial era. His son later donated the collection to the Tokyo National Museum in 1982. Korea is demanding Japan return the artifacts, claiming Okura illegally took the cultural assets out of the country. According to international regulations, stolen or illegally purchased relics cannot be donated to museums. Experts say Japan should return the artifacts to their rightful home if it cannot prove their legitimacy. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Now, if you thought you could only mail letters and packages at the post office, you better think again because um, you can in Korea. Post offices across the nation are now selling a variety of cheap cell phones. Our Connie Lee has the details. Letters are being stamped, packages are being shipped, and cell phones are being sold here at one post office in Korea. They're called budget phones. And with their economical phone plans, they're about 30 percent cheaper than those sold by major mobile carriers. I went to a number of major mobile carrier stores, and the minimum prices were about 10 times higher than these budget phones. Since Friday, these budget phones have been available for purchase from the Korea Post in partnership with six different mobile virtual network operators, or telecommunications service providers that do not own a network. Instead, these operators borrow the network infrastructure from owners like KT or SK Telecom. From the conventional flip phones to the newest smartphones, customers can choose from 17 different budget phones at their local post offices. Even Samsung's newest phone, the Galaxy Note 3, can be bought on a budget. <laughs> To lessen the burden of high cell phone bills, the government wanted a way to make these budget phones more accessible to people. That's why they're being sold at local post offices. Also, practically, it's a way for the Korea Post to make some profit as third-party vendors. Phone plans can run as low as 1,500 won, or less than a dollar and 50 cents a month. Plus, there are no sign-up fees, and you won't break the bank for a brand new phone. Currently, these phones are sold at 226 post offices nationwide. But if things go well, the Korea Post expects to expand the number of locations to more than 2,000. So far, more than 1,000 phones were sold, with most of the subscribers being older, 
or those in their 50s and 60s. Older people like myself don't need much. I just needed a phone to simply make calls and check email. Once purchased, the phones are delivered to the buyer within two days. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Now, on to the cultural front. The 31st Korea International Music Festival, the country's oldest classical music event, kicked off on Tuesday evening in southern Seoul. Uh, Park ji has the lowdown on the four-day festival. Korean violinist Ji Hyun Soo Shin is one of Korea's most talented young classical musicians. She's now starting to gain recognition on an international level after having won numerous awards at prestigious international competitions, including a third-place finish at last year's Queen Elizabeth music competition in Brussels. She's one of many artists who will be on the stage Thursday night for the festival's K-Classic concert, which introduces the nation's youngest and brightest classical musicians. The concert will be conducted by Choi soo who's a rising artist himself. This concert not only features talented and young Korean artists, it also provides a chance to listen to a contemporary music piece by late Korean composer Yoon Is Han. The four-day festival will hold concerts every night at 8 p.m. at Seoul Arts Center in southern Seoul. Organized by the Music Association of Korea, concerts from a broad spectrum of classical music will be in the spotlight ranging from a joint stage with a Korean chorus group and China National Chorus to a concert exclusively comprised of brass horns. The festival runs through Friday evening. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. OK, it's time for a weather update now with our weathercaster, E.G. Hun, who is standing by at the Weather Centre. Very good afternoon to you, Ji Hun. Good afternoon, Mark and Yuzan. Well, did you guys get to see the parade yesterday? Mm. Yes, the Armed Forces Day parade. It really was a sight to behold. Some 40,000 people, I mm -hmm. believe, were out on the streets waving and cheering the uh, troops on there. I'm sure they had a fantastic time. I'm right, sure. Right. Well, and tomorrow is a National Foundation yeah. Day here in Korea, which is a public holiday. And I'm sure there will be some very special events going on in the capital and around the country. Definitely. Well, there is a parade in Kanghua Moon in the area around the Sejong Center for the Performing Arts. And also there is a peace marathon in the Gangnam area in the morning hours. In fact, there are lots of fun festivals this month, but be sure to check the weather beforehand to make your trip more enjoyable. Well, we had a gloomy start to the day this morning, but much brighter afternoon is on tap. But it's going to be chilly as the daytime highs will only make it into low to mid. 20s for most regions. Well, right now we are looking at light clouds passing by our peninsula, but as the day progresses, the clouds will give way to sun, so we can expect much brighter afternoons. So let's look forward to that. And if you're planning to be outdoors tomorrow for National Foundation Day, uh, you can expect sun throughout the day across the nation, but it will be chillier than today as we will notice a sharp drop in our morning lows and afternoon highs in all regions so yes we gotta dress warm to not to get sick well things are brightening up here in seoul with a gentle breeze blowing through so let's take a look at our readings for the capital and other parts of the nation uh, so we'll get up to 23 degrees celsius which is 73 degrees in fahrenheit and afternoon high in daegu busan will be 27 and 26. 
Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju, Daejeon, and Dokdo will feel cooler today, while Mount Kungang remains chilly with a mix of sun, clouds, and light showers. Now that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for our viewers around the world. That's all for me today. Enjoy your lunch break and have a lovely rest of the day. Now back to Mark and Yusan in the studio. Thank you very much, Gion, for your weather report there. And those are the stories we're following at this hour. And we'll bring you more details of that security meeting between South yep. Korea and the U.S. in our next newscast at 2 p.m. Korea time.